You're listening to episode 17 of the Confident Writer Podcast with Jane Pike. Hello, amazing person. We are back hanging out together again. Isn't it the good life? If you are tuning in with me right now, there is an excellent chance that you're working on something in your training that you're looking to refine or improve in some way. What I know to be true is that good training comes down to good basics, good, 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 good basics. And any advanced work in inverted commas that we might progress to is really just a reflection of how good our basics are. Something that is frequently discussed is the aids and the application of the aids. And in most of the material that I read, I feel like there's some really important precursors that can be added on to complete the model. So that is what I want to discuss with you in this episode today. Now, what we need to understand is that in physical terms, there is no such thing as a universally understood or applied aid. There is only the aid that you have taught your horse to understand. For instance, when I was growing up, the frequent instruction for the canter transition was to place my inside leg on the girth and my outside leg behind the girth. And what I came to realize over the course of my years growing up with horses is that this is not understood by your horse unless it's been established as such. So the first step in any conversation that we're having between ourselves and our equine partners is to make sure that there is a clear line of communication between us, a common language that has been established, and that your horse actually knows the answer to your questions. I know this seems like a really obvious thing to flag up in the first instance, but you would be surprised how often this gets left off our notes. (laughs) This common language is essential, obviously, because if your horse doesn't know what it is you are asking for, then there's going to be a breakdown in communication and obviously we're not going to get to the place that we want to get to. And it's not going to be harmonious either. If I were to ask you what first pops into your mind when you think about applying the aids, what most likely will come up is that you will immediately jump to the physical. You'll think about how it is you organize your body and what it is that you need to do in order to influence the direction, the position or the energy of your horse. So thinking only in these terms, thinking of applying the aids only in these terms, which is mainly how they're talked about in traditional circles, it really limits us because it prevents us from transcending a line of communication that begins at the most subtle level. And all physical manifestations really arise from a much earlier place. The application of your aids does not begin with the physical. It begins with thought and intention. So developing an awareness of and stepping into the practice of fine tuning your intention opens up a world of potential, a whole world of possibility that really maximizes you and your horse's creative possibilities. So the very first step in the application of the aids or in asking for a transition of any sort, be that emotional or physical, is really to establish your intention. Intention is the mental and emotional blueprint that we set up that establishes the quality of the connection and it creates a clear impression of what it is we would like to see manifest in the physical. And this occurs on both a macro and a micro level. As soon as we're engaging with our horses, we are influencing every moment, whether we are aware of it or not. Establishing how it is we want to be as riders and horse people prior to even setting eyes on our horse and what qualities we wish to cultivate between us is part of our generalized setting of intention. So some of the questions that I ask myself is, who is it that I need to be today? You know, and what does that require of me? What kind of energy and thought process do I want to be projecting to my horse in the first instance that we lay eyes on each other? 
Instead of waiting for outside or external experience to inform how it is we feel or operate, our intention really calls us to step into the cultivation of behaviours and ways of working with our horses as an active practice. And I love this so much about intention. In Joyride, the very first pathway, which is called All In, is so much about transforming our goals and visions and intentions into active practices rather than waiting for circumstances to arise that will allow us to feel a certain way. We don't wait to feel calm. We practice calm. We don't wait to feel confident. We practice confidence and that really is our intention in action as the expression of our creative force. On a more micro level, intention really allows us to create an experience of the ideal in our mind's eye and that then creates fertile ground for its physical manifestation. For instance, if I'm wanting to ask for a transition from walk to trot, I create a sensory blueprint of that in my mind's eye for how it is I want it to look. I'll see my horse effortlessly and softly move into the transition in a really engaged way. I can feel the connection between us and the relaxation that we're both sharing. I can hear his footfalls on the ground really even and regular. I create that ideal version of what it is I want in my mind's eye and then I wait for the physical to catch up. When we move from this place, our body responds in ways that are barely perceptible to us, but the key is they are not imperceptible to our horses. When we create a visual template in our minds, our body responds by firing off neural pathways and muscle triggers that support the physical creation of what it is we've imagined. This is one of the key reasons visualization is so successful in improving physical performance, even in situations where the only practice that's been engaged is an imagined one. Intention also translates to a purposeful plan. It's a course of action that clearly and deliberately outlines the way forward. And that begins with cultivating a mental landscape that allows us to see what it is that we want to come to life. And that also outlines the progression of steps necessary to achieving that end. So the application of the aid and the quality of the connection you establish with your horse begins always with your intention. Number two is to adjust your energy. So once you've established your intention, the second stage is to purposely direct your energy to support it. Being able to manage your energy also comes with understanding your energetic boundaries and those of your horse. And that really comes with engaging your proprioceptive awareness. We can then marry that with your ability to ground yourself and to effectively manage your breath. So they're all beautiful synergistic qualities that start to blend together. There's a lot of confusion around what it means to make your energy bigger or make your energy smaller. And I believe this is partly because we're only used to recognizing ourselves in purely physical terms. Our boundary extends beyond the actual dimensions of our body. And the clearest way to think of this is as personal or proprioceptive space. For instance, if someone unwanted or unfamiliar comes in close to you, you are acutely aware of the point where they have breached your personal boundary. And that boundary is really different depending on who it is you're engaged with and the level of intimacy between you. And the same is true for our horses. In order to make it more tangible, if you're sitting or standing now, just think of your boundary as extending an arm's length out from your body. So to the side, above and below. Most of us aren't practiced at taking up all the space that's owed to us. And in addition to that, we have a pretty poorly developed awareness of how our boundary represents our first point of influence and how it's possible to influence the boundary of our horses without being in physical contact with them. When it comes to the application of the aids, our boundaries vary depending on whether we're working on the ground or in the saddle. 
on the ground, cultivating a clear intention and developing an awareness of the energetic boundary you and your horse have really allows you to fine tune what it is you're asking and seek out that earliest point of influence before you come into physical contact. Adjusting your energy on the ground also corresponds to purposely directing your gaze in alignment with your intention. Utilizing your breath then to support the transitions, and they are both emotional and physical, and then subtle adjustments in posture as a precursor to applying a more direct physical cue. Obviously, in the saddle, there is a level of intimacy that's already established by the physical connection of spine meeting spine. And so as a consequence of that, your energetic influence can also be much more refined. Again, a coordination of gaze, posture and breath all blend together to create momentum behind the intention that you've already established. Then we have step three. So you can see that we've already done two things. We've organized our intention and we've organized our energy before we even got to organizing the physical. And this is the actual third stage. So the next stage is the application of the physical aid. In any situation, so before insisting on follow through, just to reiterate what we talked about in the beginning, you have to ensure that what you're asking is understood and that you're clear and consistent. The effectiveness of the aid is directly proportional to the timing of the release. So in order to communicate that the answer given by your horse is the one that you're actually looking for, the release of the aid needs to correspond with the correct, in inverted commas, response. If you experience confusion, the first thing to check is the clarity of application and understanding. It's also vital that you give your horse time to actually answer the question. So avoid any unfair increases in pressure and situations where what you're asking him is really outside of what he is able to mentally or emotionally assimilate at that time. Super, super important. The fourth and the final stage, but still a really important one, is to give thanks. I am a wholehearted believer in expressing ongoing, deliberate and overflowing gratitude to our horses. In each and every situation, our horse is fully deserving of our thanks. The fact that they permit us to ride them and work with them in the way we do is an everyday miracle that we often take for granted. And I really see gratitude and thanks as the closing chapter of creating a partnership that focuses on connection. And it's part of a ritual. That's how I like to look at it. Part of a ritual that ends the time that we've spent together in a formal training situation and also marks the end point of any successful application of the aid. Wowee, so we packed quite a lot into that condensed amount of time together, but what I'm hoping to impart is that if we aspire to communicate with our horses at the most subtle level and refine our work in that direction, then the quality of communication and the application of the aids themselves needs to occur much earlier on with our intention and with the organisation of our energy. Have a play with it over the course of the week. As usual, I would love to hear your thoughts, so please feel free to let me know what you think. Thank you to those of you who have shared this podcast, subscribed, or left a review. I feel the love, and I'm super appreciative, and it's not too late if you want to do that now. And for those of you keen to dive in and adventure together in my online program, Joyride, you can check that out on my website, along with all the previous episodes of this podcast at confidentrider.online. Have a great day, peeps. Stay rad out there.